Um, so we'll, we'll kick it off, team. Sorry about the delay. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the talk. Um, thanks for coming. Um, wasn't expecting this many of you, so um, thanks. Um, and, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about site auditing. Yeah, woo. Um, so, yeah, this is something Josh and I have been uh, uh, really buried in for a little while, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, our experiences with that. Um, so, uh, here's the logo, by the way. Yeah. Um, who are these people? So, quick intros. Um, and these are literally like going to be all the slides. Like, pretty boring. So, yeah. Um, uh, I'm Sean, a technical account manager with Aquia. Uh, been with them for about three years, based out of Wellington, and work with uh, yeah a number of elite customers in region. Um, and yeah, Josh. Pretty much the same as Sean, but um, <laughs> I mean, we live in Wellington, been a technical account manager, but uh, you know, I guess our role as being a part of Aquia and being a hosting provider, we're not making sites, we're, we're hosting them and we're providing a sort of assurance layer for, layer for customers around that. Um, auditing becomes naturally a, a big part of our role as we check the work that's been done and make sure it's been done in a sort of consistent and enterprise fashion. So, so there's sort of a lot of reasons why we've, we've come about um, automating that work instead of doing it manually every time. Yeah, one thing you'll find is that TAMs or technical account managers are typically very lazy and um, <laughs> we don't like to do the same thing twice. It's just really painful. Um, so this kind of leads us into the why. Um, why go to all this time and energy to write this tool? Um, yeah, um, so just a quick question for the audience here. Like, uh, who's here has launched a Drupal site? Just raise your hands. Oh, yeah. And uh, who here has uh, forgot to turn off user registration so that anyone could register? Yeah. How many people added the um, username enumeration module to prevent people from guessing the, the ID and be able to hack or understand which users there are to try and brute force. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it gets pulled up in security reports all the time, but, but we never ever include it in our builds, right? Yeah, so the point I'm trying to get to there is that if you've got a pretty good pr um, process to get a site live, you might have an Excel spreadsheet. Um, if you're, a government de you're working for a government department, it may be a very long Excel spreadsheet. Um, and typically, there's a list of things that you'll go through before the site is like, ready for to go live. Um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, make sure that caching is turned on. Make sure that user registration is disabled. Make sure, etc. Um, and yeah, we at the time we're doing a lot of work with uh, well, Toby's team from the Department of Finance uh, for GovCMS, and. Yeah, it's all it's all fine and dandy when you've got like one site and you launch it one you know, one a year. You maybe you can deal with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, what if you're launching a site a week? Um, you know, what if you're launching ten sites uh, a week? Um, and even like after you've launched it, how do you ensure that the site owners haven't done something silly? Um, because as we all know, content authors have their own special way of uh, uh, editing things. Um, like, ah, caching, oh, that just gets in the way. Pfft, turn that off. <laughs> There's also um, a lot of different opinion in the community, right, about how you, what, what is best practice or how you might go about, in, you know, in your dev shops, how you practice doing Drupal development. So from a hosting provider perspective, you get lots of these different points of views about how you're going to do something. And it's kind of hard to remember how to check for it all, like, you know, are they using, um, you know, uh, what's it called, the panels, right? And you know, what are the things you check for in that scenario, or if they're using display suite instead, or something else, or paragraphs, you know, the different choices in architecture are going to require you to look at things in a different way, and how do you simply know that, you know, every, based on every module that's in use, you know, what to check for to make sure that you know, there's some best practice there and there's no poor, poor use, essentially. Yep, yeah, for sure. Um, so before I embarked on this journey of like, you know, creating, you know, it started off, it actually was called site audit, but um, anyway, 
uh, before I embarked on the journey of actually making all this tooling, um, and you know, we actually looked around to see what was uh, out there uh, in the community already. Um, so I'm not too sure. Uh, does you want to use the checklist API? It's yeah, a couple the, of the uh, security review module. A few people there. So yeah, I th these. These are good examples of modules that rely on you having the modules turned on before they will work. Um, what happens when you don't have the module turned on? How do you audit the fact that you haven't turned the module on? It's kind of this really of sweet. They paradox. can't audit themselves that they're turned off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how do you find the really bad sites on your cluster? Um, and there's another tool. It's called Site Dash Audit on. Uh, Drupal.org, I think, and um, the maintainer, I hope it's not in this room, but if you are, um, <laughs> the tool I created at the time was called site underscore audit, and it was like, hey, that's not the best name, it's very confusing. Um, uh, but the, the tool site dash audit uh, is a Drush extension, and at least it audits your site from the outside in. Uh, because, it's, but be, because it is a Drush based extension, you can only run Drush based checks, uh, which sounds fine until you want to do something a bit grander than that. And the main issue I had with all these tools that exist was that they force on you a best practice. And your best practice for your suite of sites is going to be different from you know, someone else's what version of what they decree to be best practice. Even within the same company, you may have different styles of sites and you may want to create a best practice for each style. Uh, so it's, and none of these tools are really catered to that, That's this ability to create a profile and to uh, audit a site against a profile. Do you just want to bring them all up at the same time? Mm -hmm. Just bring them all up at the same time, the, uh, all the other bits. So these are just um, a couple other reasons why. So, um, you know, we, we obviously want the, the site to conform to a, a particular pers you know, perspective of, be of best practice. Um, that could be across performance and security, but also org policy. So um, in certain circumstances, like let's say, and in, in, in what we get a lot of in, in TAM work is, you know, a customer who needs to deliver 40 sites, right, in the space of a year. Now you try and do the math on that, you know, every couple of weeks they're, they're delivering a new site. So there out goes the door, the idea of being able to do three-month projects or something like that, right? So they immediately need to have multiple uh, dev shops involved to be able to deal with their pipeline of sites. They need to make sure there's a consistent way that everything's being done so that at the end of it they can continue to manage this in a sane way. Um, so they might have some sort of specific ideas about how Drupal is developed that you need to conform to. Um, you also see this happen in distribution. So in um, <coughs> the GovCMS distribution is a, is a good example that we use a lot, where in order to be on that platform, there are certain things you need to comply with, certain liberties that you get given in the Drupal distribution, you're not allowed um, <coughs> purely because you're on a government platform. Um, and so, you know, when we make sure that they're not actually turned on, for example, someone's not given themselves the administration permission and they have the user one taken away from them, that sort of stuff. And that's not stuff that the community is going to say is best practice, but it's stuff that we need to, you know, need to order all the same. Um, consistent baseline standards and validations is just about something more to do with maybe what you might want to put inside of your own dev shops. So you might say, this is our policy that when we put a site out and we deploy it, we're going to run this order over it. It's just going to give us this, this sense of sanity that we're uh, outputting to the customer a really nice you know, uh, site. Well, we, you know, it's got it's, it's launch ready, right? It's got all the security bars checked. And even before it goes into performance testing or security testing, if your customer's paying for those things, um, you know that you've got your um, all, all of that area covered. So you're going to get back a nice report. It's going to make you look good and make the pen tester look like he's not doing his job. Um, and then, you know, the, the, we, we automate this stuff. So the Sanity Chicken automated just means we don't have to do it over and over again, which also means that we can run more stuff in a smaller amount of time and we can do that consistently, which is always fun because what we're sort of finding as we're building this tool is that there are just loads and loads and loads of these policies that we could be writing uh, and implementing 
and we don't want to have to be doing them manually every time because it just doesn't scale. Yeah, and just in some conversations with people at the conference, I've already got like, I don't know how many more ideas for uh, new policies to, to have a look at creating. Um, oh, yep, missed one. Oh yeah, the other thing that we do <laughs> with the reporting is, um, so like in the case of using say, um, the checklist API or the site review modules or any of the things that are out there, you know, security headers, IO, there's loads of different places that you can go to to put your site through some sort of best practice assessment. The thing is that it's, that it's everywhere. So if you want to roll it up into a unified view, it's quite hard to do. And so you know, Drutney, Drutney is basically taking uh, an approach at trying to do that. And, and part of the architecture is being a, a, an adapter sort of system. So um, we talked about this a little bit more, but we're actually able to uh, create adapters onto other systems that can then do the job for us. So you know, Drush, for example, is an adapter that we use to be able to get information out of the Drupal site to do audits on. Uh, so now we move on to the what. Uh, what is this uh, magical thing? Uh, so in case it's not immediately apparent, uh, Dr Drutony came from, again, the name was our crowdsource because we're, we're not creative. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, someone suggested Drupal Scrutiny. We actually had a, like a spreadsheet of names and this was the best, so hopefully it's <laughs> it makes kind of some sense. but. Um, essentially, uh, Drupal Scrutiny or, or Drutiny is a, an automation layer that helps to uh, audit and uh, report, and it's not mentioned there, but it can even remediate, if you want, the issues on, at the moment, D7 and D8 uh, base sites. And for those that no Symfony. Um, it's written using Symfony Console, uh, which is, I think, one of the best frameworks to start from for a CLI application. I was going to say, even on top of that, it's actually built on Composer. So it's um, unlike this, the other modules that we were talking about earlier, where they're, they've got to be installed into Drupal for you to use them. This is a completely outside in uh, architecture. So you don't have to install anything in your Drupal site to be able to start using this, and then you can run it from your laptop without having to run it on your your you know, uh, production hosted environment. But you can still run it on a production system. Yep, and one of the key goals was to make it pluggable. So because the nature of these types of checks is that not everyone will, will want to open their internal private company checks to potentially a public, uh, you know. Uh, project and um, we needed a, a way to structure it so that they could still audit their sites for their sensitive or you know company specific checks and have them so they could plug it into the main uh, you know the main Drutiny project. So a good example of that um, at Acquia we use Sumo Logic as a log aggregator and then we can run query and analytics over the top of that. Um, you, know, you might use something similar in your own dev shop with something like Splunk perhaps. Sumo Logic itself actually has an API so I can, I can automate a query to it uh, and I'm basically able to construct Drutiny uh, policy audits so that I can check what's happening in the runtime environment based on the log analysis from Sumo Logic. This is kind of cool because this is not actually looking at information from the Drupal site, but actually the logging output from things like uh, the watchdog or from the Apache log or from our Drupal request logs. And we can run you know, analysis and then have all that, that computation be done by that service layer and then report that back up into the single view report that we're getting that's also looking at things like uh, Drush, uh, settings in Drupal through Drush, etc. Yeah, and like that's crazy, right? <laughs> like you can now plug in external tools into to Drutiny and use it as an automation factory. Uh, yeah, and that largely, you know, massive kudos to Josh for rewriting 2.x, the new branch of it, but we uh, have a massive library of uh, uh, policies um, and we'll go through some of them like at a high level, what's like there. Um, but these are you know, plug and play. Um, how many do we have now, Josh? Uh, I'm not too sure. Loads. Um, Loads, okay. Uh, over a hundred, something. Technical term. <laughs> Heaps. 
And it's also uh, open source, GPR v2, um, my favorite license, Drupal's favorite license. Um, so it's going to be yeah, free open source forever. Um, GPR was a brilliant virus license, so if someone wants to take Druni and you know, go crazy with it, it also will be open source. Yep. Um, and the how. Um, so, I'm not too sure we want to go through with all this one, but. Should we give a demo and then talk about how you can install it? Yeah. Luckily? Alright, I'll plug in me. Just a quick laptop switcheroony. I upgraded this week to High Sierra. Apparently that was a bad idea. Yep. Uh, oh, yep. Oh, yep. Cool. So uh, it's a command line tool. What I have here at the moment is um, a Drutney sort of dev project that you can use and, and compose it to, to set up. So it's just like a, as we mentioned before, Drutney is a, a pluggable architecture. So the actual core package doesn't give you a whole lot, but you've got to add whether you want Drupal 8 plugins or Drupal 7 plugins. You can run both of them in parallel if you like, uh, whether you want distribution plugins. The idea is that we can kind of see the community of different plugin types and you can just compose a add them uh, as you need to audit with those things. Uh, so the, the, the dev package just really provides like a baseline for, well, personally my development, but um, it, it helps um, you know, as, a, as a great demo space because it has all of the checks in there. So um, to kick off, um, you know, like all Composer uh, projects, you have a bin directory, sometimes in vendor. This one sets it up just in the root directory for, to make things a little bit easier. And Drutney is just simply a command line tool from Symfony. So if you haven't used Symfony console before, that's just kind of the, the output that, that you're going to get out of it. You'll see there that there's uh, a, a bunch of different types of checks there, um, including pro policies and profiles. These are really the two. The key things is also audit generate, which is going to help you generate PHP code for writing audits later on. It's a, you know, contributing a different topic, but um, uh, but this basically, when you introduce into into Drutney, the, the first things you probably want to look at are the lists of, pol the, of policies that are available. Uh, so, well, okay, the big screen is not going to help there. If we can make this a bit smaller, there we go. Uh, so this is kind of the list of stuff that we have available at the moment. Uh, I've got a bunch of stuff in here that's also, as you can see, Acquia based. Uh, the Acquia stuff is public, Acquia CS, you don't get your hands on. Um, but there's a bunch of other stuff in here, with Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 checks that are already built in. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you can see in there already like Drupal 8, checking that the error level is, is correctly set or checking that Fast404 is set up, check that JavaScript aggregation is turned on, make sure that the NIT modules uh, disabled, make sure that there's no automated cron running uh, because you're a real site. Uh, and then no backup and migrate modules, modules are turned on, that sort of stuff. So uh, there's some really great uh, base policies in here that you can start uh, executing against. We can actually run a single policy against the site, so we'll try that off uh, by it to start with. Um, so we can say, let's check cron last. Uh, and then the argument you passed in to reference your site by default is a Drush alias. So basically the way that we, we access sites is just using Drush aliases. So if you've got that loaded up locally, it'll read that and then just use that directly uh, when you're doing an audit. So I'm going to put in here uh, a site that I've been uh, working on. Uh, and this alias is actually in reference to uh, an, an environment hosted on the Acquia platform remotely. So I'm going to do that audit remotely now. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah, I renamed the, yeah, the, the yeah, thing. <laughs> so it's called audit. Oh, uh, yeah, it's awkwardly cut off. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, cool. So right there, it just did a single uh, policy assessment. Told me that last time Cron was run on that site was on the 3rd of November. That's greater than 24 <laughs> hours, and so it failed the assessment. 
uh, which is great. It tells me that maybe Cron should be running there. Cron's probably not set up. I could do some further analysis to correct that, rerun the audit, and then get it get it fixed up. Um, so that's how you can do the sort of checks in a one-off. But if you were to do that for the big wealth of policies that we have lined up, it would still take you a long time, even though automated, to do with the checks. You know, if you've got 20, 100 <laughs> different uh, policies to run, that's, that's a pretty arduous experience. So the other thing that we can do instead is uh, look at profiles. And, and profiles are, um, you know, just collections of, of policies. So there's a bunch of ones that I have here, but basically, um, you know, you can set these up yourself. The idea is you can compile your own uh, policies. It's all in YAML, and you just maintain a collection of policies that you're going to use for a particular purpose. Um, so uh, by default, you get the Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 site audits that come out of here. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from, you know, making your own and having a more refined approach to this that might, you know, you've got to recognise that there are things that you can put out into the community that are going to kind of work as a baseline for everyone, but it's probably not going to be a professional level profile that works for your use case. So, you know, we, uh, I sort of struggle a little bit with that, with trying to prepare this uh, software for the community. So, um, you yeah, really, uh, you sort of use it. To, the, to how it works for you, and then the idea is for you to extend and adapt to it based on the needs that you have and what you want to assess and audit. So kind of like as a tech lead or a lead developer on a project, one of your roles might be to look at defining your profile, defining what you just you know, decree to be best practice for that style of site. And hopefully then you know, it can then be passed on to the other developers in the team and you can get that running, you know, on their local environments. You could get that running on your, you know, obviously your production and test environments as well. Yeah. So um, here I've got a um, command line for the specifying the profile, so the D8 profile. Again, running that against the, the Drush alias. So this time around, because I'm running 22 uh, policies instead of just the one, it's going to use Symfony's uh, progress bar. Uh, capabilities and then just run that right. uh, through to completion. <laughs> cool. And so now I get back a, a much more useful report of the current state of the site, right? There's like a whole bunch of other things there that I might want to think about addressing, but there's also a bunch of stuff that's passed, which is really cool. So I know what the, the state of the site kind of looks, looks like. Um, now that's really cool, but it's not something I can give to a customer because I don't read command line. So I can pass in... Uh, Hang on. Just dash format equals HTML dash O for output report dot HTML. So now I can tell the report to actually render this whole thing in an HTML format. So now it's going to give me a web page, and it's going to give me a web page that I can print to PDF, and then I can attach in an email and send off because we live in 2017. And, uh, does it? Well, I used to. There's other output formats as well, so you could have like a JSON for instance, so if you want to bundle it into CI and make Travis like trigger early, something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you can see that okay, I don't know if upsizing is going to make that work better. Yep. Um, so it gives you a, a roll up of what happened in the report and then you can actually click on that and go to a more detailed expansion of what's happening inside that, that audit. So there's, um, you know, an example here. So in the audit, this particular audit, it's asking to ensure that the email address is actually set to uh, no reply at .com. So because it's not set to that, it's going to fail that, that audit. Um, and the idea here is to have um, sort of rich content that, you know, all these, these green ticks is what your product owners are going to kind of love and say, yeah, we're doing best practice. Um, and then it, you know, it does also show stuff. So under the hood, we're, we're using um, a bunch of cool tech like moustache templating and YAML uh, template files and markdown to ensure that we can you know, go through different states. So um, you get the default command line output, but you can also output the thing into HTML or JSON format uh, if you wanted to do further API integration with the Drupal as, itself as well. Cool. Any, any questions so far? Is this looking useful to people? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One thing I'm I'm really keen to get out of this session is um, 
uh, we're having a bit of a think about it, but it'd be really cool if we knew if this was going to be useful to your team or your company. And if it's not, what do we need to do to make it useful? Um, like, what's the check that's missing that you need that you do all the time? Um, that if, if it was in this tool, you'd go, I'd use it in a heartbeat. So, um, yeah, we can, like, you can chat to us after the talk, you can raise your hand anytime, or you can just write a, create an issue in the issue queue on, uh, on GitHub as well. So, on that, uh, sort of talk a little bit about um, how you guys can get it working, because one of the, the ideal uh, outcomes of today's talk is that you guys have Drutiny running on your, uh, your own computers, your laptops, and you're able to run an audit against the site that you have. So obviously there's some prerequisites there. You're going to be able to you know, download the tool and you're going to be able to have a Drush alias that you can point at either a local site or a, um, a, a, yeah, a site that you've, you're hosting somewhere. Is there a question in the back? Just stretching. Okay. So do you use it to audit the production sites as well? Yeah, and the question was do you audit, uh, use it to audit production sites? And yeah, you can. Um, I mean, obviously, some, some audits might have a performance impact, so you need to be mindful of what those things are doing. Um, there is actually the ability here for you to uh, run the audit in high verbosity, and you can actually see what uh, Drutney is doing in the background. <laughs> so here you can see um, I mean, it's running kind of quite fast, but it's actually running a bunch of Drush commands in the background, and then the different... Um, classes are evaluating the output. So right now it's just outputting the stuff that uh, that it happened. So like here's a here's a drush command it ran. There's the output that it returned and then the audit itself which you don't get to see in the in the verbose output uh, is doing something with that information to determine uh, the output for you. As you can see most like profiles um, and most checks um, run very quickly. Some, I think the only one I can think of, which is going to be quite careful of potentially, is some of the file system checks. Um, like one of them, like just does a, a massive find command and finds the largest files in your public files directory. And if you've got like a hundred or a thousand files, it's going to be okay. If you've got like a hundred million yeah, and you're using like NFS, yeah, maybe not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you just kind of need to be mindful, and obviously, like we've we've taken a lot of precautions in the the audits that we've run that we've built, um, but that's not necessarily the case uh, if you if you open this up to a contrib space, right? You sort of free as in beer, but be careful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Chris. Yeah, uh, so uh, there's a bunch of stuff in that question to get back into the recording. Uh, can I do content checks and can I do other stuff that's maybe not Drush related? Can I sum summarize as that? And the answer is yes, uh, but but no. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, Drutney is completely abstracted, so there's nothing stopping you writing the ability to do those things. Um, okay. I've been vigorously writing um, the 2.x branch and haven't implemented anything like that. So the, what I want to do next is uh, HTTP header assertion. So I can check that certain HTTP headers are coming back. That's actually really more auditing a, you know, a, a, an up-running environment, right? That's not going to be so valuable to audit on a dev environment, but it's going to be a, a good thing to point at a production system. Um, and it's actually similar to what you know security pen testing does uh, anyway. So we, we want to capture and ensure that around the external tool integration, um, with the one that X branch had integration with a tool called Phantom Mars or Phantom AS. I don't, I'm not too sure how you pronounce it, but essentially it's a wrapper around Phantom JS that tells you stuff about the page, like the home page in this case, and things like page weight, number of 404s. Uh, you know, just stuff that you should be aware of. Is, is there an error in your JavaScript that's running in the front end? So a little bit different from linting, um, but still um, incredibly valuable. Like, right? yeah, like, it, and again, like these tools are born out of like frustration and laziness. So I was having to launch a site with uh, Johnson and Johnson. Like, I don't know how often, but and consistently, they'd have 16 meg homepages. 
It's just like, they loved it, like high-res graphics, definitely. And I was like, I sure don't want to be loading up a web page and opening up the Chrome Inspector and... Oh, life's too short, eh? I remember one of those sites had a video, right, on the front page, which meant that it took, like, 30 meg to, down, you know, to, yeah. to run the front page. Yeah, I think um, it was actually the India site, too, and it was... Um, and, like, bandwidth in India, I think, is a little bit of a commodity you'd be quite precious about, so, yeah, kind of funny. Um, but on that note, um, another one of my customers has a requirement for automated accessibility checking. Uh, and there's a command line tool called Pally, P-A-1-1-Y. I don't know how to say that tool either. Um, but same principle. You can get Drutney to wrap this tool, Pally. Pally will output JSON. Uh, as to accessibility of the page, which can be configured 600 ways from Sunday, and then it will provide that back into one or more uh, policies within Drutney. So you might have a policy which is text is not too small, uh, color contrast is fine for the body content. Yeah. Um, so let me show you here. Um, this is a, on GitHub an example of a policy. So all those those policies that we saw earlier. And they're all actually just written out in, X, in, in YAML. And the whole point of that is we've kind of got two contributing spaces here. One is um, policies which are kind of more content focused and they're for people to quickly ad you know, adopt uh, ways of generating new policies. So. Um, and then you have audits, and audits are the, are the PHP classes that actually do the, the heavy lifting inside of Drutney to, to conduct the audit. So an example of an audit would be a, um, you know, a class that checks to see if a module is enabled. But then a, a policy would be um, something that checks to say the shield module is enabled or disabled or what have you. And so the policy utilizes the audit, audit to be able to carry out its, its work. So in this instance here, we're looking at the anonymous sessions one. So it's a check to make sure that you know, there are no anonymous sessions in the table. If there are, there's going to be some performance issues because you can't do anonymous caching. Uh, and so we're, we're basically checking that uh, before the site goes live. Um, so we've got a title there, we've got a class which tells Drutney which PHP audit class it's using to run the audit through, uh, just providing the PSR, you know, the PSR4 namespace, uh, and then giving it a name, the name is the, the sort of machine name, if you will, that we use in the command line and to reference the, the policy itself. So you've got like a human friendly one and a machine name friendly one. Tags, just kind of, you know, token metadata. Uh, description, which is, then becomes that kind of front-facing content side. So policies are kind of more content-heavy than functional. Uh, remediation, so here's the advice on what to take, uh, the steps to take to rectify this issue. Uh, you know, and then the outputs of whether it's successful or the outputs that you give if it's, if it's a failure. Mm. Um, and then you'll see in the sort of failure description there, we're using markdown syntax, so the double stars to bold the content, and then we're using the double... Uh, what do you call those curly braces, um, which is moustache templating, which uh, gives uh, basically variables that get generated inside the audit that we can then use as rendered output here in the uh, uh, in the consoles. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. It also decouples kind of the front end human ready bit from the PHP bit, so um, hopefully makes it a bit easier to um, contribute as well. So if you guys wanted to give this a go now, um, by all means, check out the GitHub page. It's probably the, the place to start. So just GitHub Drutany forward slash Drutany. Uh, and there are a number of different ways that you can run the installation. So by default, you can just try, um, you know, you can actually technically require it into your, your current Composer projects. Uh, and it can sit as a, dev de as a dev dependency. So, you know, you don't build it as a production artifact, but it's there as a part of your uh, auditing system. Or you can just run it as a standalone environment. Um, the way that I kind of recommend running it is the, is the second uh, alternative here, which is using the Create Project system in, in Drutney. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of different plugins here. So Drutney, Drutney is one of them. But there's also like Drutney plugin Drupal 7, Drutney plugin Drupal 8. Uh, and you know, we plan on sort of expanding that out in, in a very kind of modular sense. So. Um, It'll be quite, you, you kind of have to essentially pull together the libraries that you want to use and you have to know what those libraries are. So um, this 
create project method is designed to be create sort of like a development environment for Drutney development and it just pulls them all down so it gives you access to all of the policies that are available and then from there you can pull together your own profiles so um, also I should probably mention that if we check out the plugin for Drupal 8 say Um, so this is what a, a, a profile looks like. It's just, at this stage, simply a, a name and then a list of the policies that you want to run inside of it. So it's really like simple collection, um, and you can you can build your own, right? So if you write your own profile, you give it a .profile.yml extension to it, Drutney just automatically sees that and lets you execute it. So there's nothing stopping you from writing something that's very specifically targeted towards um, you know, your own sites. Uh, and that's in fact exactly what we've done. Um, oops, what am I doing? That's exactly what we've done with, with GovCMS program. So GovCMS uh, have, you know, uh, if you guys don't know about the, the program there, uh, it's a, a multi-tenant site plat uh, hosting platform for Drupal uh, exclusively for, for the government in Australia. Um, and so it allows lots of different agencies who have their own budgets, uh, their own objectives to come and use the, the sort of common GovCMS distribution. And they get to select their own partners who they want to work with to deliver the Drupal site. So when the Drupal site arrives at, at the platform ready to be hosted, it comes in all different shapes and sizes in reality because it's been through a different customer, it's been through a different uh, partner, and we don't really know like how well they've conformed to the standards of you know the Drupal of, of, of the Australian government essentially. So there's a bunch of policy and compliance there that we kind of need. And you know we've got responsibilities as a hosting provider to ensure that that, that site conforms to it. So we ended up building this this tool, um, and we've got a 2x branch which. Uh, I think we get to sort of move into stable, but it's essentially using the Drutney 2.x architecture. And what it does under the hood is pull in Drutney and then produces a FAR file. Uh, you guys familiar with FAR files? PHP, if PHAR thingies. So it has one of those now as a release, so we can actually provide that, and, and it's just a packaged version of essentially Drutney and then its own very own opinionated profile, right? So it uses a collection of the Drutney uh, tests plus some of its very own, and then says this is the the, the opinion of how uh, a GovCMS um, <coughs> site should look, right, in Drupal 7. And like, I don't know if, if anyone went to Max's talk on uh, Composer, it was like a 10 minute lightning talk, but yeah, if you don't like uh, Composer and it's not your thing, then yeah, there is a way. <laughs> um, something I also didn't mention earlier is that uh, audits have the ability to pass in variables to them. So if you don't like the way that it audits, you can pass in a particular variable that changes the uh, auditing levels, you could say, for that, for that audit. So uh, a good example here is there is a, uh, a checklist for blacklist permission, permissions, ensuring that there are no roles that implement or allow these permissions on that site. Um, so in this case, we get to pr provide a pass in a variable inside of the profile, and it can also be p passed in in the command line to say which permissions are blacklisted in this case. So it gives you a lot, a lot of granularity as well. So you can sort of really tune that. Same thing like, for example, if you had a, a minimum cache lifetime that you wanted to enforce, you could set that as a part of your profile as a, as a variable to check but against as well. Just more configuration. Again, like this was missing from the other tools that we did a search for earlier. Like you couldn't customize the way it was running that particular check. Um, so now um, it's infinitely configurable. And uh, I think we've just been told we've got not much time left remaining, so maybe we should switch to Q and A for sure. five yeah. minutes. Well, we could if you there's the afternoon scene now, so we could move it upstairs. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to, uh, if you guys want to give it a whirl. Um, use that command Josh had up earlier to get the project up and running locally. Um, create a profile. Maybe start with a local environment before just going ham on prod and um, definitely come speak to Josh and I uh, upstairs if you want to um, hear more about it. And if you want, we definitely keen to know if you're uh, keen to use this tool. Um, and if 
yeah, if there's something that we can do to help make that easier, uh, let us know. Cool. Question. The executable port bridging, does that need to be installed on the machine being ordered or on the workstation? You can no. uh, run it as a standalone package on your laptop if you want. You can run it on a dedicated box if you want. You can install it into the code base and deploy it to prod if you want. Um, it's kind of up to you. Uh, how you yeah, so it just rely, it relies on access to those sites through a Drush alias. Yeah. So if your local Drush alias has the XSH credentials to get to your production environment, then Drutney can get to your production environment. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's also worth mentioning that Drutney is a don't change anything by default. So uh, you can tell it to change things, but by default it won't. So, so it's pretty. John's like talking it. about the rem remediation capabilities. So you can, like, let's say you've got page caching. You want every site in your hosted cluster to be set to a, a minimum of an hour, and you find someone set it to five minutes. Well, you could choose to auto remediate, and so as it's going through the check, it just shifts it up into an hour. Yeah. So it's optional, but it's handy. Yes. Uh, is there a way for the actual applications to find their own kind of audit, custom audits? So yeah, so there's, um, we've got a bunch of documentation on read the docs. Yeah, legit, right? Uh, and <laughs> in here we've got some docs on how to write audits themselves. So there's a whole um, you know, step by step here are the functions you need to implement. There's the potential return values that you can give. Uh, you can talk about like doing prerequisites if you want. So there's, yeah, there's, great docs here for writing PHP classes. There's also a bunch of audits already available. So you might there might be an audit available that you could just need to write a policy for instead, which is just in YAML, so it's just a, little, a bit faster, yeah. uh, less, you know, less PHP work to, to work through, because once you start writing audits, you'll, you know, may need to test all the different scenarios, like can you ensure that, that the test returns false when it's supposed to turn false? Can you ensure it returns positive? And there's like... Uh, Learn a lot during that process. For example, different versions of Drush want to different output different formats of JSON. So you've really got to handle that. Different versions things. of Drush, so good. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's not going to work with Drush <laughs> nine since you need yeah. aliases and Drush eight for the win. <laughs> so right now it's like eight. Yeah, but yeah. Roman. Fight. No, you couldn't do all of these things with BHAT. So um, Dr no. Drutney does, um, I mean, you could actually have Drutney run BHAT underneath yeah. the hood, but you couldn't have <laughs> BHAT run Drutney, right? So the... And, yeah, BHAT's like behavioral testing, um, like go to the homepage, and say I can find the login button and maybe click it um, and maybe log in. Whereas Drutney is like, uh, it's a tool that could run BHAT um, to do that. As long as BHAT can return like machine readable stuff, then you could integrate it. Um, BHAT's yeah. also supposed to be built out of business requirements. So, you know, given a scenario, when yeah. I do this action, I should see this, and that that statement should reflect a business requirement. Whereas what Drutney is doing is reflecting on best practice, right? So there's nothing in a business requirement that says your error logging shouldn't go straight to the UI, right? Or that you yeah. shouldn't have yeah. database log turned yeah. on in production. You should probably set the time zone to be your time zone. It's right. probably not going to be a business requirement. And so these are all just kind of like small, niggly sanity t things that if you just have like a you know, broad spectrum check, you can make sure that you've got them all right before you hand the site over. It's kind of like polish in a way. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've got to call it. A little bit upstairs. Yeah. We've only got... Thank you.